and the positive feedback that I've been getting while speaking to emetophobic sufferers about these podcasts has been fantastic. And Good. sort of for anyone that is listening, we are starting to draw together a bit of a direction of how we want to take these podcasts and really start rattling them out for you so that you can get a proper deep dive into specific subjects. And ultimately, the more that you can learn, the more that you can understand about how your phobia is formed, how you maintain it, the more likely and the easier it will be for you to overcome it for good, right? So that's what it's all about. Sounds good to me. Fantastic. Cool. Okay. So in today's podcast, we're talking specifically about why it's not and why it has never actually been about being sick. So, oh, that, that for little anyone subject. Yeah. That, that little yeah. subject. Yeah. yeah. Just that kind, kind of, tiny okay. little, very important one. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, I don't want to scare anyone off that's listening or, you know, think that we're, you know, totally weird and have totally missed the mark on what it's like to struggle with having metaphobia. Okay. Because we're not taking away anything from how difficult it's been, but we do want to give you a more realistic understanding based off of the research that you've spent years and years and years developing. So you've got nothing to lose. You might as well listen. And you never know, you might learn something that will help you out massively around your phobia. Okay. So if that's all good, I would love to dive into it. Cool. Okay. Well, why it's not about being sick. Okay. If I may start on a slightly different question again. Okay. Please. please uh, why, totally why does it matter that it's not about being sick? Okay. Why does it matter about it not being sick? Okay. So first of all, when you think that sufferers of any phobia feel powerless about their phobic subject, whatever, whatever it is, the reason they have a phobia is because they feel powerless specifically about managing their emotions or controlling their emotions in a situation okay whether you've got a fear of spiders a fear of lifts a fear of cancer or a fear of being sick and being around vomit what you're actually fearing is the the emotional onslaught that you experience when you're in your phobic situation it's not actually the situation we know that there's loads of research around this it's not the situation itself and it's not necessarily a realistic threat of anything but it's a it's a massive amplification of a set of really unpleasant emotions that you're trying to do anything you can do to never go there again I, I don't want to face that I can't face that what happens though is in any phobia the easiest thing that for people to do is to avoid the thing that is triggering their phobia and I use that word um carefully i don't normally use it yeah. uh, um but i'll explain mm -hmm. why in a minute so if i if i suddenly today develop a phobia of spiders and i'm terrified at seeing a spider in in this uh, busy chaotic world the easiest thing for me to do to not experience that fear and terror again is just to not be around spiders right you know, yeah. I could go for some psychotherapy. I could go for, I could take some drugs. I could do some exposure. I could do all sorts of things. But actually, the easiest thing for me to do is to not go in that broom cupboard and to get my wife to take the spider out instead. Okay. And it seems like a small thing, but I'll just avoid spiders for the rest of my life. And I'm avoiding facing up to this hugely traumatic, um, stressful set of emotions and feeling vulnerable and scared and all this sort of stuff, which is incredibly unpleasant. So that's that's the main reason why people tend to focus on an object because it's the easiest thing. Excuse me. It's the easy. You can bleep that out, right? It's the easiest <laughs> and simplest way of us taking back some control. Any phobia, every phobia, is about control, or rather, the lack of control. We feel out of control. We feel we have no control over how we're going to experience that thing. And so we have to avoid it. I cannot cope with that. I have to avoid it. Okay. So it's about control. So the first and the easiest bit of control I can take back is not going in the broom cupboard where that spider is. The first thing I can do if I develop a fear of lifts, don't go in lifts. 
I'll take the stairs. Right? I'll take the stairs. I won't go to a big shopping centre where there aren't any stairs. I won't fly from Gatwick's fifth terminal where you've got to use the lifts to get upstairs. Um, and I won't go to any skyscrapers or I won't go and visit a friend who lives in a tower block or anything like that unless there's stairs I can go up to get there. Okay? Not a massive thing. It's not going to impinge on my life too much. And I avoid my phobia. Okay? Because I'm taking back some control. Because we then take back a little bit of control and our phobia decreases, you know, if I, if I lock that cupboard door and don't go in there where the spider is, I feel more in control, I feel safer, then my emotions calm down, and that furthers my belief that it actually was about the spider. Because if it wasn't about the yep. spider, how come I feel calm and relaxed now? Okay, so and the, the worse the phobia or the more in-depth the phobia, the more scary the phobia the more you are inclined to want to take back some control. And I've said many, many times, the worst phobia I've ever come across or ever treated by far is a metaphobia. So it's not surprising that sufferers of a metaphobia put much more effort than the average phobic into controlling how much they allow themselves to be exposed to it. You know, why they don't eat certain things, why they don't drink certain things, why they wash their hands a certain way, why they don't see certain people, don't go to certain places, all that kind of stuff. All these safety-seeking behaviours are attempts at them to control what's happening. Why is it then so important? Well, because... I'll give you a stupid metaphor, right? If If my phobia of spiders was, in fact, a phobia of cups of tea and I'm spending all my life trying to get over my phobia of spiders, it's never going to happen because actually my phobia is about tea. My actual phobia, any phobia, as I said a minute ago, is a fear of being out of control. A fear of being out of control, and specifically a fear of these agonisingly horrible emotions and panic and um, vulnerability and anxiety and all, all those other horrible feelings like a panic attack i'm f i'm fearing those feelings okay and all i can tell you is that whenever i see a spider i feel those feelings i can't control the feelings but i can control or at least i can attempt to control how often i see a spider so all of my efforts then because i feel yeah. i don't know how to control my emotions right but i know how to shut a broom cupboard door I know how to not have milk in my tea, right? Yeah. I know how to wash my hands five times when I come into the house. That that I can do. I can't control my emotions around vomit, but I can wash my hands five times. So you do the thing that seems mm. the easiest thing to do. But, of course, all the time you're doing that, if you've been a metaphor for five years, for example, you've done tens of thousands of safety seeking behaviors that are confirming every time that your phobia is actually about being sick when it never was in the first place now we know this because in the literature we know for example that something like 22 percent of emetophobes have never been sick 22 percent have never been sick how could it possibly be about sick they've never been sick yep. okay um we know that about 16 percent of emetophobes uh, don't remember the last time they're being sick, have no memory of being sick. And we also know that something like uh, last count, about 55% of emetophobes, when asked about the last time they were sick, say, do you know, it wasn't that bad. So their experience of it has nothing to do with how big their phobia is. Now, if you go off on a tangent slightly, that's borne out by the fact that there are somewhere around 12 million people in the UK with a fear of flying, and none of those people have been in a plane crash. Hmm. The most any of them could have experienced is some mild turbulence, right? So it's not that, no, you're never going to meet anyone that says, oh, i got a terrible fear of flying. I was in this plane crash in Canada back in 68. You're never going to hear that story because that, that doesn't happen, right? Most people yeah. that have been in a plane crash, and I've been in two that I've crashed myself, um... <laughs> It, it it you know it tends not to be that traumatic unless there's death involved or something horrible, right? You get over those things, okay? You get over those things. So, twelve million people with a fear of flying, none of them ever been there in a plane crash. A significant number of metaphobes 
don't remember being sick or have never been sick. Okay, it's got nothing whatsoever to do with being sick. It's got everything to do with how a person uh, is able to manage their emotional and psychological responses to certain things in their environment. Okay, and yep. we are sensitized to certain things in our environment by the way in which we're brought up. Okay, so for example, uh, particularly in the Western world, uh, young girls are put under uh, in much more intense pressure and social pressures when they're growing up, particularly between the age of about eight and 16 than young boys are, okay? Intense social pressures, um, not just about the way they look and their body shape and size and all this kind of stuff, but about how they perform, how they behave, all this kind of stuff. Because of that, uh, young girls tend to have a lot higher social anxiety uh, than young boys, okay? A, a, a benefit of that, you could argue, is the fact because they feel under so much pressure, they work harder in schools, they generally get better results, okay? But because they're under so much more pressure and because they tend to have higher social anxiety and social anxiety is one of the key drivers of a fear of being sick, that's one of the reasons why the vast majority of people with a phobia of being sick are women. Yep. Because that social anxiety is one of the driving factors. Okay, Another one of the driving factors is um, disgust propensity, which tends again, because it's partly linked to um, social anxiety, it tends again to be uh, significantly higher in women than in men, disgust propensity. Women are far more likely to feel disgust at bodily functions and um, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and those two things, higher social anxiety, higher disgust propensity, they account probably for somewhere about 90% of the reason why 95% of all emetophobes are female are because of those two things. So again, and just to touch on never... the discuss propensity, sorry, yeah. Rob, just to, just to touch on that second as well, just to make it clear to the people that are listening, it's not because women are naturally born with a high disgust propensity, right? It's not genetically no. handed down. It's because they're raised to, you know, they, they, they fear more social pressure around picking their nose and, you know, farting in public and little boys laugh about, you know, going to the toilet and telling their friends about it and, you know, all of those sort of things that generally speaking, women and young girls are, you know, told not to do, oh, don't pick your nose, that's gross. Whereas boys, you know, pick it and show it off and that's hilarious, right? So then <clears throat> the, the girls are learning and developing a higher discussion. I hope your mother watches this podcast, Joseph. <laughs> I hope sure your mother watches be, it. Yes. I was never She'll told it's all right many to times. my nose. Um, mm. Yes, but also, but also, the, the physicality of it is normalized in boys, okay? <clears throat> uh, you, you know, in the UK, when you start primary school, age four or five, all boys go to we in the same place, or they certainly did in, in, in when I grew up, when you grew up. I know it's getting slightly different now. But, you know, all the boys went for a wee at the same time in a trough. So you're used to seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, you're used to seeing other people uh, going for a wee. You're used to seeing other boys' genitalia. All that kind of personal secretive stuff gets completely yeah. normalised. I asked Mary, and most of your viewers, most of our viewers will know of, of Mary. So I asked Mary when she was 84 uh, the same question. At age 84, she had never gone to the toilet or done anything personal like that in front of another human being. It was still brand new to her. The idea, the idea of, sorry to be blunt, right, but her sitting on the loo having a wee while her husband was in the bath, for example, never done it. You and I, age three or four, were already weeing at the trough with everyone else, okay? So it all gets normalised. There are no parts of your body you have to hide there are no secret things that 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 you know uh, young boys do that that nobody else knows about do it still against advertising standards in the uk particularly to advertise female sanitary wear on telly in a in a non-sensitive fashion okay yeah. so so nappies you might want to edit this out right 
but you're allowed to advertise nappies for babies, okay, by having two pots full of coloured water, dipping a nappy yes. in and yeah, showing which yeah, one. You're not allowed to do yeah. anything like that. You're not even not allowed to show a tampon or a sanitary towel, okay? All you're allowed to show is a lady riding a bike and running across a field looking wistful in summer and calling right. it a secret. So all right. of these things propagate the the secretive and keep it private, uh, um, hide all these disgusting, dirty things away, nature for women, which doesn't happen for boys. And that's one of the contributing factors to why the vast majority of emetophobes are female. Yep. You wait for me. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 it makes sense, right, when you think about it. But at the same time, important to remember that Although there are, you know, lots of different elements that have built up your metaphobia in the first place, that doesn't mean that it's not diff It doesn't mean that it's difficult to overcome. Okay. It is a, a simple process. It's just about understanding it and, and breaking those elements down and building more positive, helpful and powerful ones in the place. It's, it. It, you know, it's, it's very, very predictable who will create a metaphobia. Uh, the sort of person, the type of thinking styles, the type of beliefs they have, who can make, create a metaphobia. It's a very, very uh, specific group of uh, beliefs and thinking styles. For example, you cannot have, you will never create a metaphobia unless you've got social anxiety. You will never create a metaphobia unless you've got disgust propensity. It's impossible to create a metaphobia unless you're a little bit of a brooder, a little bit obsessive very difficult to create metaphobia unless you've got a high desire for control so all those ingredients together and several others have to come together to create a metaphobia all those things have to be present for a person to focus on the scary thing enough to build it up day in day out into something that they're you know pathologically frightened of and when you when you look at something like emetophobia, which to anyone that struggles with it, seems like, you know, a mountain that they'll never be able to climb and never be able to overcome. But when you start looking at it as just a fear of being out of control of your emotions, it already begins to put you in a more favorable position mentally, right, in yes. terms of breaking it down and, and getting over it. So that sort of begins to ask the question, which obviously me and you know the answer to that many listeners, and I'm sure anyone that is still struggling with metaphobia don't necessarily know, would love to know how can they begin to go about building up their coping skills around their emotions around being sick? Okay, well, that was easy to answer. Okay. It, it, even though, even though you're suffering, so we answer it slightly differently. So what is the main, if someone's got a metaphobia, what is the main thing that they are doing to maintain and propagate that belief, right? Because it's only a belief, like, like all yep. phobias and fears, right? They have this belief, okay? How are they keeping that alive? The main way in which they're keeping it alive is by maintaining the belief that it's something that is happening to them. Hence, why it's so important for them to realize that it's not about being sick. Okay. Because something being sick is outside of you. Okay. So I got, so I can't control the weather. Okay. Let's say I'm getting married in summer. Uh, and most people in the UK try to get married in summer because they want favorable weather. Okay. And I can do everything. So you can spend, you know, some celebrities spend millions and millions of pounds on their wedding. Okay. And then it rains on the day because there's one thing you can't control is the weather. Okay, the weather is outside of you, it's external to you. You cannot control it at all. So I feel completely powerless. I can get everything right for the wedding, from the music to the guests, to what I'm wearing, to the invitations, to the presents, the prizes, the band, absolutely everything. I can control down to the minutest detail, but I have no control over what the weather's going to be like. I feel completely helpless and hopeless about the weather. Okay. When someone who has any phobia at all, every day several if not hundreds of times a day is telling themselves and reminding themselves wrongly that this outside thing is happening to them to cause their phobia 
they're rendering themselves more and more powerless, which will make them more and more frightened, feel more and more out of control, which will have the knock-on effect of them trying to control it even more, which is why their safety-seeking behaviours and symptoms tend to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Because every day they're telling themselves repeatedly that this terrifying emotion, this feeling, this phobia, this panic, this... Um, you know, this, this horribly vulnerable feeling is happening to them. It's outside and it's happening to them, okay? And by maintaining that belief every day, believing it's this sickness thing, this thing outside of them, making them feel this bad, they're perpetuating, in fact, propagating, making worse their fear of being out of control. So the first yep. thing and the easiest thing they can start to do every day even though they've still got their phobia and it still feels horrible, is to say to them, this, this is absolutely horrible, but I'm doing this. Yep. I'm doing this, okay? I feel terrible, I feel absolutely awful right now, but it's something that I'm doing, okay? Mm -hmm. Because even though you feel just as terrible, right, I'm in the middle of a panic attack right now, okay, and I feel just as terrible having a panic attack, by telling myself that actually it's something I'm doing, I actually feel a little bit more powerful. Although at the same time, it's a dichotomy really, because in a way you can say, well, I'd feel worse if I, if I know that I'm doing it to myself. But it starts you on a journey of clawing back some control and taking some responsibility for yeah. it. Yes. You, you yeah. cannot change the weather. Nobody ever, other than probably NASA scientists, right? any effort in to try and change the weather why would you you can't change it when you feel powerless you don't put any effort in while you believe that uh cups are causing your phobia there's nothing i can do but avoid cups but the moment i realize the moment you convince me joe <coughs> excuse me the moment you convince me that it's not cups it's not outside of me but rather the way i emotionally respond to cups I still feel terrified right now, but knowing that something I'm doing, I feel hopeful and positive. Well, if it's something I'm doing, maybe I can learn how to change that. Yes, and when I suddenly yeah. feel and, a bit more also, hopeful, when I feel more hopeful and powerful, what do I do? I start to put more effort in to cope with the feeling rather than just trying to control my environment. All the efforts, not all, 99% of the efforts that an emetophobe puts in to their life to manage their phobia is about avoiding situations that might expose them to it. They put in very, very little effort, understandably, into coping because they don't believe they can. They don't believe there is anything they can do to which will enable them to cope them better. In the same way as I don't believe there's anything I can do to change the weather. I can just sit here and hope and pray and keep my fingers crossed that the, the sun comes out on my wedding day. There's nothing I can do about it. So taking, telling yourself every day, this feels horrible. This is the worst phobia in the world. I get that. It's horrible. It's awful. You know, I, I, it, it's the worst thing in the world. Absolutely. Okay. But it is something that I am doing to myself somehow. And if I start yeah. to realize that, I can start to maybe change some of the things I'm doing. Okay. You start to look inside yourself for answers rather than outside. That is the first and most important step to recovery. Yes. Yeah. Bob on. Cool. And also alongside of that, it's very important when you're coming to that realization, right? Maybe you're sitting here listening to this podcast and you're, you know, a bit hesitant to sort of, take on board what we're saying because it's so vastly different to how you've been thinking about your phobia for the last 20 years but if some of what particularly you is saying is making sense to you listening in right now when you're starting to try and implement this new way of thinking about it this very important way of thinking about it is to not give yourself a hard time for understanding that it is a thing that you're actively engaging in because yeah because doing so god this feels like you know this is when i put my hand up in front of the teacher and they go and carry on 
doing so is only going to lower your self-esteem. It's only going to make the whole issue a whole lot larger to scale and overcome. Being kind to yourself, being charitable to yourself, giving yourself a bit of patience, you know, reminding yourself that you've been doing this for such a long time, yeah, but now you want to do something differently. You want to overcome this. You want to start moving in the right direction, but you're not going to nail it overnight, yeah? You're not going to snap your fingers and your phobia is just going to dissolve around you. It is a steady process, but you might as well be kind to yourself whilst you're doing it because that's going to make it a whole lot easier. And I'd go one step further than that, and I would probably say, I don't know that I would say that it's impossible, but I would say that it's very, very, very unlikely that until you start being nice to yourself, your chances of overcoming are very low. Yes, You know, we talk about this in other podcasts. This, we're talking about perfectionism, aren't we? We are. Yep. We're talking about perfectionism. And people that are perfectionists, which are metaphobes are, it's one of the things, again, they are. They have an abundance, like being brooding or obsessive. They're all perfectionists. And, and the thing about that is, there's nothing wrong with setting high standards for yourself, but what a perfectionist does, they set incredibly high standards. And if they don't meet that 99%, they absolutely think they failed and then they beat themselves up something terrible, which yep. lowers their self-esteem and it raises their social anxiety, which are two of the contributing factors for their phobia in the first place. Okay. Yep. So they have to be charitable and kind to themselves on their journey. So when I say, tell yourself that I'm doing this to myself, I don't mean beat yourself up. I don't mean say, oh, Rob, you bloody idiot. You're creating this phobia yourself. That's just going to make things worse. But I charitably say, right, for some reason, somehow, I'm doing this, and all I need to do is find out what I'm doing and slowly reduce it, and the phobia is just going to slowly, slowly disappear. I can do this yeah. by raising my self-esteem, by feeling good about myself, by overcoming some social anxiety, and a number of other things that we talk about in, in the uh, manual, in the program. I'm going to slowly put this fire out and take back control. And that's how ultimately they overcome their phobia. But they won't do it if they're being horrible to themselves and beating themselves up. Can't do it. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have a nice deep dive in another podcast to come. Maybe the next one, maybe the one after that about looking at perfectionism and looking at the importance, you know, really deeply understand the importance of being kind to yourself now you know it's quite a simplistic sounding thing well obviously it's important to be nice to yourself but there's a lot more to it than that and we'll spend a good half an hour really talking about that and really getting you up to speed on the importance of so um if I, can i interject as a on whole that? I can think... I... Go on. sorry there was a lag can i interject on that one sec so most most of our viewers and listeners will have watched um mary's videos if, if you haven't please do mary had a metaphobia for 75 years really badly uh, as you all do and overcame it in six weeks mostly by herself i did have one session with mary um and that was about perfectionism and beating herself up and i went to see her she lived in essex she was 82 at the time and, and had had a metaphobia since she was seven for 75 years and she was almost over it completely but there's one thing that was holding her back and i said look i'll come down and see you i went down to see her and i started to tell her that it is bound to be her perfectionism when an emetophobe is almost completely over it but not quite there and there's something that's holding them back it's almost always perfectionism it's almost always the fact that they're beating them up somehow and mary being mary argued with me she said, I'm not a perfectionist, Rob. That's not the sort of thing I would do. I said, well, let's talk about it over a cup of tea. She went to make a cup of tea, and she dropped the tea bag on the side, okay? And she, and she just started to say, oh, Mary, you stupid. And I'm like, there you go. That is perfectionism, okay? And, and she looked at me, she goes, oh, my God, that is me. And the realisation of how quick she was to beat herself up and to call herself a bad name and to give herself a really hard, you know, she, what, what she wanted to say is she, she wanted to call herself a bloody blithering idiot. You're not a bloody blithering idiot just because you drop something on the side. At most, it's a tiny error that can be easily resolved. But the want and need she had to beat herself up, that was the single thing that was stopping her from getting completely over her phobia. And within a couple of weeks, as you know, if you watch the videos, um, 
you know, she was completely over it and has never looked back since. And that, I think, was six years ago now or something. So that that's how important not being a perfectionist, not beating yourself up is. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. And for anyone that wants to find those videos about Mary, if you do a quick YouTube search on a metaphobia free Mary or a metaphobia free Mary and Rob, you'll very quickly find those videos. And they're a great listen because she is fantastic and a proper character and, you know, a really good lady to take a lot from in relation to overcoming your phobia. Um, I think sort of coming towards the end of this podcast, I just wanted to say that if you are listening to this and, you know, you're, you're taking on board a fair amount of what we're saying, but there still might and easily could be a big part of you that's saying, oh, they're making it sound so easy, so simple, or how could it possibly be as straightforward as that? But if there is any, even the tiniest part of you that's thinking, maybe they are right, you know, maybe, maybe they are onto something, then it's so worth you having a look at the program. Yeah, because you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain, okay? If you don't want to fail or you're worried about picking it up, have a listen to the podcast beforehand and listen about how you can't fail going through it, why you simply have nothing to lose because there's no point carrying on living with your metaphobia when things could be so much more different for you. On okay. that note, Joe, I've got a, I've got a real-life example of that at the moment. And it, it, it's, it's difficult for us because you and I more than most know how badly emetophobes suffer. And I sometimes think that that I when I talk about the program, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound too easy, for the risk of offending people. Okay. Yes. But it is easy. Okay. It is easy and simple. Okay. But what happens is people conflate easy and simple, with, uh, not requiring effort, and that's not what we're saying. Okay. No. It this requires a ton of effort. Okay. Yes. It's hard work. But the process is simple. And, and my personal experience of it is I'm doing a couch to 5K at the moment, okay? And the process is really simple. Each day or each couple of days, you walk or jog a little bit further, a little bit faster, and you're building up your skill set and your fitness, okay, to the point where in three months or four months or five months or six months, I'll be able to run 5K, three miles without having a heart attack, right? The process is really simple but I have to put in hard work every day, okay? The process is simple, it's easy to follow, but it, you are going to work hard to do this. You are going to work hard to get to that 5K to overcome your emetophobia. It's simple, but it does require hard work every day. Yep, yep. Perfect summary of what we do, yeah? Nice, cool. Anything else to add? I think we're, uh, I think we're there. I think we've rounded up nicely for everyone. Uh, if I may reiterate, to it then. So the reason why it's so important is because it's very difficult. It's impossible to take responsibility and to put effort into changing something that you believe is outside of you. And a physical action is something that's considered outside of you. A phobia is something that's considered outside of you. OK, so gently changing your belief in a kind and charitable way to not this is happening to me. This came over me for no reason, but rather some way I'm doing this to myself. You start to feel a bit more powerful, a bit more positive, because even though it's horrible, there's a light at the end of the tunnel where there isn't for most emetophobes at the moment. You're going to find it really hard to overcome it whilst you believe it's something that's happening to you yeah okay yeah cool lovely. lovely right thank you for listening everyone i hope you enjoyed plenty more to come so stay tuned and thank you so much for your time rob no problem at all see you next time mate. <music>